Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Uh, so it's my uh, pleasure to introduce uh, Imina Tolak. Um, she's uh, finishing her uh, PhD from MIT uh, with uh, Daniel Jackson. Uh, she's been working on a, a constraint solver for software engineering, uh, Cut Cut. Uh, I'm told that uh, the, the little cat on the slide is uh, is a Cut Cut. Uh, it's apparently the smallest cat, but very fierce, and it can. Uh, it, so fierce that it can attack cows. So if there are any cowboys around here, so uh, please uh, be aware. Um, thank you for the introduction, Nikolai. And uh, thank, uh, thanks to all of you for coming. Um, the topic of today's talk is going to be uh, this new solver for relational logic called CodCod. Um, I will start by defining more precisely um, what kind of a relational solver CodCod is. Uh, then I will tell you a little bit about the motivation behind this project. Uh, the main part of the talk will, of course, be the technical part, where I will tell you how this thing works and uh, what uh, technical and research, research contributions went into it. Um, I will conclude with a discussion of results and future work. So, in broadest terms, um, CodCod is an engine that takes three inputs. A formula, a universe of discourse in which this formula is to be interpreted, uh, some bounds on the values that the free variables can take. And uh, given these inputs, it uh, tries to produce a model or an instance of this formula drawn from the universe. If no such model exists, it produces a minimal unsatisfiable core. Um, it is essentially an explanation of why this thing is uh, unsatisfiable. And um, it is, in fact, an irreducible proof unsatisfiability, as um, I will show you later on. To be more mm -hmm. specific, um, the input to Kotka, this formula, is a set of constraints, first order constraints over expressions that are built out of relations of arbitrary arity using the operators of relational algebra. So you get a transit closure, joins, products, um, unions, and so on. The universe is simply a finite set of uninterpreted atoms. Um, so CodCod actually uses it as a Java API, so you can think of it as just as, as, a, as a set of Java objects. Uh, the bounds and free variables are what distinguishes CodCod from similar tools, um, such as um, Paradox, Alloy3, Mace, and so on. Each free variable comes uh, with a pair of bounds. The upper bound tells the solver what tuples it may use in order to try to satisfy this formula. The lower bound tells it what tuples it must use. And Together, these lower bounds define what is called a partial instance. In essence, it is a partial solution that you give to the solver that it needs to extend in order to satisfy these constraints. If this is possible, it will produce an instance, and this is simply a binding of the free variables to sets of tuples, and this binding satisfies the formula, of course, and it respects the bounds. If no such instance exists, it will produce um, or, and, 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 of course, the part uh, that does the model finding is called the finite model finder. If no such instance exists, it will produce an irreducible cause of unsatisfiability. In other words, if you have 100 constraints that you fed to the solver, and only two of them are contradictory, it will return those two and say, this is your cause of unsatisfiability. If you take away any of these constraints, um, it becomes satisfiable. And uh, the part that does this uh, minimal core extraction is unsurprisingly called a minimal core extractor. Now, the next most important question that uh, everyone wants to know. Go on. Sure. Uh, this, uh, you know, these bound, the bound business, the third uh -huh. box uh -huh. in, on the left, uh -huh. uh, that is not really needed for making the problem decidable, right? Just because you have a finite domain, it's already decidable. That's right. It's already decidable. This um, is actually um, needed for performance. And uh, so, for I example, will. You could have encoded all that stuff in the formula itself. Exactly. Do it explicitly for some performance reasons. Exactly, and I will explain that later on. Um, you don't have to. You could actually, but uh, you actually gain a significant performance benefit if you separate the assertional knowledge, which is a partial instance, from the definitional knowledge, which is the formula itself. Okay. Okay. Can 
minimal core is locally minimal. It's locally minimal, yeah. So it's not, it's not the minimal, uh, I, minimal core. Yeah, yeah. I think in South lit literature they call the global minimum a minimum core. So this one is just a minimal. It's a local minimum. That's right. Um, so the next important question that um, everybody asks, of course, is, uh, okay, this is all great, but who cares? Um, why did you build this thing, and uh, where does it sit in sort of the larger scheme of things? Uh, so to answer the lat latter question, uh, this thing turns out to be fairly useful for software engineering. In the two years since it has been publicly available, uh, it has been the back end of the nine tools that are shown or this on this slide. Uh, so it's used for both analysis and synthesis of software artifacts. And there are two or three more tools in the works that perform similar kind of things. Uh, on the static analysis front, um, it is used for design analysis uh, expressed, for designs expressed, for example, in the alloy language or in uh, XUML with OCL constraints. Uh, on the uh, static code checking front, there are three code checkers, two built at MIT, Forge, and Karun, and one built at um, IBM Research that um, perform bounded analysis of Java code against um, um, structural properties. So for example, these checkers can tell you that if you have a red-black tree and you insert something into it and you're working with a tree for, with say up to 10 nodes, it will still preserve the red-black property after the insertion. Um, for dynamic um, analysis, it's been used at uh, UT Austin in uh, two tools. Uh, one is WISPEC for a white box testing um, of software and the other one is, is a specification based test case generator for software product lines. Um, in terms of synthesis, uh, it is used at Telecordia Research in a tool Config Assure to automatically configure networks. Um, so as you can see, there's a little uh, user interface here, and uh, these, uh, these red uh, columns here um, are using the unsatisfiable core. So if it's actually impossible to satisfy the rules um, that you think that should hold for your network, um, the tool will actually help the network operator and tell it where uh, the bug is essentially. And it's also been used for uh, uh, core scheduling. There's a little um, application running on the MIT website that will help the student um, decide what courses to take given the course requirements and the thing that he or she has taken so far. Um, so it's pretty good for engineering. Uh, it also turns out to be good for uh, text generation. Uh, there are about, this is a partial list of publications about CodCod and that use CodCod. Um, they include a PhD thesis, a master thesis, and several publications at major conferences, um, FSC, uh, TACAS, FM, ISTA, ICSI, and so on. Now, all of these things uh, came after the fact, so uh, they couldn't have really been uh, the motivation for the project. They're just kind of a pleasant side effect. Uh, the reason why I really took it on is uh, threefold. Um, first one is, it's an interesting problem, right? So as uh, Shaz was pointing out before, you don't actually need these partial instances. Uh, and other model finders that exist out there don't have them. So if you have a formula and you know something about the solution, the only way you can encode it is by giving it more constraints. And if you give it enough constraints, the problem will become so hard that, it's, that the solver is going to choke. It just won't be able to do anything. So you essentially end up in this paradoxical situation, which is um, against your gut feeling, meaning that the more information you have, the harder the thing becomes. And it should be the other way around, right? So the other thing that uh, was attractive about this problem for me is that it's hard. For relational model finding alone, there has been 10 years of research and uh, three versions of Alloy, and, this, and a lot of very smart people uh, have worked on this, and there's still room for improvement. In fact, in order of magnitude, more room for improvement, as uh, we will see later on. And the last but not least is, it was really fun. I mean, this is the kind of project that uh, is a computer scientist's dream, I would say. Uh, you get to prove theorems, you get to design algorithms, you get to write some code, and um, some warm, fuzzy feelings from uh, emails from happy users uh, don't hurt either. So that's the uh, what and the why behind the project. We're ready to talk about the how, and I will explain uh, the technology behind CodCod using uh, an example. So this is, um, so let me introduce the example first. Um, suppose that I'm going on a very hypothetical vacation at this point, and I have a large collection of unsorted files that I haven't seen, uh, some movies and some music, and I want to take some of them with me. Now, I have all the metadata about these files um, that you might imagine, but I don't want to go through them by hand 
to figure out which ones I want to take, right? So what am I going to do? Obviously, I'm going to write a program uh, that's going to solve the problem for me. It will select these files according to some constraints, put them into a hierarchy, essentially sort them into uh, directories, and put them on my MP3 player, right? Um, incidentally, this is a constraint solving problem with partial instances. You have your finite universe, it's the files and whatever directories uh, you're going to sort these things into. Um, the partial instance, the things that you already know, is the metadata, and what you're solving for is the containment hierarchy. So if we were going to do this for real, if we were going to write a program that will generate these constraints and feed them to COD COD, uh, we might first start by just defining what it means for something to be a containment hierarchy. And here are four constraints in relational logic that do this. The first one says that the root of the hierarchy is a directory. And uh, notice here that I, don't, that, that I don't make any distinctions at all between sets and relations and scalars. In our logic, they're all the same. A set is a unary relation, and a scalar is simply a singleton set. So um, I use the same um, notation, um, if you will, for all of them. The second constraint says that um, this contents relation, which is a binary relation, maps directories to files or directories. So the only things that are sort of internal nodes of this containment hierarchy are the directories. Um, the third one says that everything on the MP3 player that I eventually put in there is reachable from the root by following the contents relation zero or more times. So here, dot means join, relational join, and the star is reflexive transitive closure. Uh, the final constraint says that there are no cycles. So if you start in a directory, look at its contents, look at the contents of its contents, and so on, you will never um, end up at the same thing. And uh, here, the caret is transitive closure um, itself. What so star reflexive. Is reflexive reflexive transitive closure okay. and caret is transitive closure. So it's zero or more times versus one or more times. Um, now, to do anything with it, uh, we have to give it a universal discourse, and this is a smaller toy version of the problem for explanatory purposes, of course. Um, and you can guess by looking at these symbols which one of these I mean to be directories and which I mean to be files. But uh, Kotko doesn't know that. So in order to connect the formula to the universe, you have to give it some bounds. And this is what those look like. Um, here it's saying that the file relation may range over the uh, file icons. The directory relation may range over these things. The root is the MP3 player itself. And here you see a tiny partial instance. I'm essentially telling the solver, don't bother looking for solution in which uh, either the blue or the green folder is the root of the hierarchy. It's, it's just the device itself, right? And uh, the final one is um, the upper bound of the contents relation, which is simply the cross product of directories with the entire universe. Now, looking at this, um, can uh, anybody take a guess um, as to if there is a hierarchy that satisfies these constraints? It's not a trick question. There are actually several solutions. And um, here is a sample solution represented graphically, and uh, let's check that it satisfies the constraint. Um, so the files, the file relation here in, uh, in gray, they're drawn from the correct set, from the correct upper bound. Same for the directories, same for the root. Everything is reachable from the root, um, and there are no cycles. So the constraints are satisfied, the bounds are satisfied, uh, we're happy. And if you're not happy, uh, now is a good, a good, good point to interrupt me because uh, we're going into the technical part. Don't, um, prevent sharing. Oh, it's too bad you said that. I oh, know they don't, and we will come to that later on. So it's incomplete at the moment. Uh, we're, we're starting with a partial, partial solution. Yeah, yeah, it's incomplete. It actually does allow sharing. By sharing, you mean that it's not a tree structure that represents? No, not yet, not yet. Uh, so we're going to fix that later on. So this is just uh, version one, and it has bugs. So now we're ready to uh, talk about how this thing actually works. Uh, and here is the architecture diagram. Code code is simply a compiler. Uh, it takes these three inputs and translates them into an equisatisfiable formula in propositional logic. Uh, some of the boxes that you see on here correspond to well-known algorithms, and I will not be going into these. Uh, my contributions come in the highlighted boxes. Um, the first one is a new translation 
uh, from um, relational logic to propositional logic that uses sparse matrices and uh, compact Boolean circuits. Uh, the second one is a symmetry detection uh, algorithm that works in the presence of arbitrary bounds, which is what we have um, in our input language. And the third one is a minimal unsatisfiable core extractor. Now, I will talk about the extractor in, uh, in, in the COD COD framework, but it is actually uh, applicable more generally than that to any declarative language that has a translation to a clausal logic that is input to, uh, say, a SAT solver or something else that's capable of producing uh, resolution proofs. So let's start with, uh, at the beginning, let's start with the translation, and we'll do it by this example. I'll show you how to translate the highlighted constraint. Uh, our translator is a bottom-up translator, so I will do relations first, then expressions, and finally formulas. Relations are translated as matrices. So a relation of variety k becomes a Boolean matrix with k dimensions. And we use the lower and the upper bounds uh, to populate the matrix. So for example, the file is a unary relation or a set. It's represented with a vector. Um, the upper bound says that uh, either the music, uh, the music file or the video file can be in the upper bound. So we don't know anything about the presence of these tuple uh, in this relation. And we represent that with Boolean variables f0 and f1. Now, for the directories, we know for sure they are not going to be ever bound to the file relation. So we can actually fill the remainder of that matrix with zeros. Um, the same holds true for the directories. Uh, for the roots, and this is, uh, this is where the answer to your question about partial instances comes in. Um, why they're useful is because you're giving the, me this assertion knowledge, you're telling me this tuple has to be present in this, um, in this relation, I can put a one in that matrix. I don't have to uh, allocate any Boolean variables. And if you give me enough of those, obviously the resulting SAT formula is going to be a lot simpler and a lot smaller. Uh, the contents relation, uh, it's a binary relation, so we actually, uh, have a matrix, and again, uh, for example, the tuple C0 represents the presence of the tuple um, uh, root to root uh, in this relation. For expressions, well, these are simply um, matrix operation, operations over these matrices. So for example, union is a disjunction of two Boolean matrices, as shown there, and the cross product is a generalized cross product mm -hmm. of uh, k-dimensional matrices, again, shown there. Uh, Formulas, this is how we blast everything to SAT eventually, um, are simply constraints over matrix entries. So here we have a translation of the subset constraint, and it does the obvious thing. It says that everything in the left-hand uh, side of the matrix implies uh, the corresponding uh, Boolean value in the right-hand side of the matrix, and this gives you the uh, semantics that you want. If, it's some, if something is in the left-hand side, then it must also be in the right-hand side. So this is how uh, the translation works in theory. Um, of course, if you implemented this, uh, it wouldn't scale in practice for two reasons. The first one is, uh, note that uh, the two rows of this matrix are empty. It's not a big deal for such a small matrix and for such a small universe and for RT2. However, for matrices in larger universe, universe and we do scale to universes of 100 or more, um, this sparseness becomes a serious issue because um, especially if you have a ternary matrix, for example, it is actually exponential in the arity of the relation. Um, the other thing that's a problem is um, if you look at the two things that I've highlighted in blue, I've given you two different representations of the same formula. We know from the law of commutativity that D0, D1 is the same as D1, D0. In fact, if you look at anything that's reflected across the diagonal, you will see that it has the same uh, property. And for the diagonal itself, well, these are simply tautologies. So I'm generating a lot of junk, um, or, or, or the naive one, the, the naive translation is generating a lot of junk that uh, really shouldn't be making it uh, down to the SAT solver. Now, the sparseness issue, yes? Are, uh, it just says juxtaposition I, is, is conjunction? Yeah, I'm just saying that D0, D0, I didn't need to generate that. I could have just written D0. That's all I I'm didn't saying. Decide in both. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, yeah. So I just D and F, these are Boolean variables? That's right. I thought that you were going to generate one Boolean variable for each box. 
each so, entry in the matrix. So you generate um, one Boolean variable to represent the relations, right? But when you actually perform these operations um, of the matrices, uh, then you generate circuits inside of each one of them. So, you know, uh, the matrix multiplication here, we just use conjunction instead of uh, multiplication. And uh, this tuple right here, for example, um, represents the presence, or, or the, this circuit right here represents the presence of the corresponding tuple in the expression. So the relation matrices contain Boolean variables, but the expression matrices actually contain circuits. So this is the right, and this is basically, uh, so that's a set. That's mm -hmm. another set. Mm -hmm. And, and now you have relation. a set of pairs. Yes. Um, okay. So we have two vectors. We take a cross product. We get a matrix, right? And in the resulting matrix, each entry uh, represents the presence of a corresponding tuple. So here we say that uh, if this directory relation uh, if D1 is true in the directory relation, and if D2 is true in, in this expression, right, then, then pair, must be true, pair. right? So it's represented by that circuit, um, right? Okay. So now where, are the, where is the redundancy there? So the redundancy there is, uh, uh, let me show you. I've generated, if you do this naively, you will generate two different formulas that represent the same circles, uh, circuit. So here, this uh, conjunction D1, and D0 is actually the same as the one above, D0, D1. That's what's confusing. I thought D1, D0 means that there exists a pair in that, in that set of pairs in which the first element is D1 and the second element is D0. Is it not like that? No, it's just a, it's just a circuit. Um, it's just a Boolean value that represents the presence of that tuple in but the relation. A, I should think of it as a disjunction or a conjunction of all these Boolean values. Juxtaposition is conjunction. Yeah. A juxtaposition is conjunction yeah. and presence is disjunction. I mean, then what? No. Yes. I see. Okay. It's conjunction. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So, um, in the past, uh, for example, the predecessor of Code Code Alloy 3 has handled the sparseness issue using dense rectangular, rectangular matrices. Um, this only works if you have a type language, which we don't, and if, in addition to that, your type system is completely flat. Um, so we handle this with um, k-dimensional sparse matrices that are represented as interval trees. Um, so if you're familiar with uh, sparse matrix algorithms, you can think of it as a general generalization of a row compressed form to arbitrary dimensions. Um, for the redundancy, um, previous versions have handled this by actually walking the relational tree and trying to figure out which bits and pieces of relational syntax are going to be transferred to the same formula. Now, that approach will not detect these low-level redundancy within a single matrix itself. Um, so what I do instead, um, I use on-the-fly sharing detection with this data structure that's called compact Boolean circuits. And uh, it's a hybrid between Boolean expression diagrams and reduced Boolean circuits. I will not be saying anything more about this um, because I don't have the time, but if anybody wants to hear more about it, I'll be happy to talk to you in person. And um, that finishes the translation part. We're now ready to talk about symmetries. Um, so to do that, we go back to uh, our old friend, uh, the toy file system, and what I would like you to think about is what would happen if I took the leaves of this graph, I chopped them off, I reverse them and I stick it back on. Would the resulting graph still be an instance of this problem? Yes, yes, I see a lot of nodding heads. Um, what about if I took out the blue folder and I replace it with the green folder? Still an instance, right? Um, so what this is telling us is that these atoms are symmetric. And these symmetries between atoms in, uh, induce isomorphisms between instances. So of each of the instances that I've shown on the screen, you can obtain it from one of the other ones by applying some permutation uh, to the universe that respects uh, these blue boundaries that I've shown here. Now, for practical purposes, what's more interesting and important is that this relationship holds also for non-instances. That is, if I take a binding that is not an instance of this formula and I apply any of these symmetries to it, I will still get a non-instance. So this guy here, for example, is not an instance because of that self-edge 
which is prohibited by the last constraint. And uh, you can get all the other guys from the first guy by applying um, any of these permutations. Okay? All right. So how do we detect symmetry? Uh, oh, well, first of all, how do we use symmetries? Um, well, if we had some means of telling the SAT solver which things are symmetric, then it could prune the search space. Uh, when it first tests this thing uh, labeled with the question mark and decides that it's not a valid binding, it's not an instance of this formula, like that, does it need to test the rest of these guys? No, the answer is no, because it knows for sure that they are also going to be uh, bad solutions, essentially. And um, how do we find instances, or how do we find symmetries, um, that is? Well, let's uh, put this uh, information that's uh, hidden in these graphs into a more mathematical form. Um, so how did we obtain G1, the graph G1 from G0? We interchange the file atoms, right? And in the cycle notation for permutations, we will represent that like this. It simply says, exchange the files, leave everything else as it is, right? Now, we got G2 from um, uh, G0 by exchanging the directories. Uh, G3, what did we exchange? Everything, right? We exchanged the folders and we exchanged the files, which correspond to this permu uh, permutation. And we're left with one last trivial permutation. You can obtain G0 from itself by applying nothing, essentially the identity transformation. Now, what I would like you to observe um, here, now that we have this uh, nice annotation, is that if I, if I apply any of these permutations to any of the sets that are shown on the bounds, I will get the same set back. Some of the tuples uh, in these sets will be interchanged, but the contents will be the same, right? So if I took this thing here and um, I applied to uh, this bound, it won't change anything, so I'm getting the same set back trivially. Uh, if I apply to this bound, it will flip these atoms, but it's still the same set. It doesn't change this one, and in this one, it just changes the order of these two, and obviously, if you do the multiplication, you will end up with the same set, right? This turns out to be a general result. Um, in fact, if you have an analysis problem like this, however complicated the formula is that you're trying to analyze, you can completely ignore it. All you need to do to find the symmetries of this problem is to find the symmetries of the bounds. It looks like the symmetry is the canonical representation you're going to have to use to do that. It's the same as that you would use in the matrix to compress the matrix. Um, it turns out, and this is the bad news, that finding these symmetries is actually quite hard. It's, hard, it's as hard as graph automorphism detection. And the proof of, for this is very easy. Um, you can take any arbitrary graph, and here's one shown here, and you can express it as a bound, right? So uh, each edge becomes a tuple from the source to the target. So if I was able to find all the permutations that leave this bound unchanged, I would have solved the graph isomorphism problem. So I didn't quite understand your comment about not needing to look at the formula, only the bounds, mm -hmm. because before we established that you could express all those bounds in the formula itself. So if you did, uh, then, um, then you wouldn't have any bounds, right? All the relations would arrange over the entire universe, so everything would be symmetric. So everything would be a symmetry of that problem, right? So, and, and because you are choosing to express these bounds in this way, you're reducing the number of symmetries, which makes sense, right? Because you already know something about the solution that you want, so it won't be, so all the other ones won't be as good as the one that extends the thing that you already know. Fewer symmetries will lead to better performance. Yes. Because if I have, if I had a relation where only one of the two file icons is part of it, right, then mm -hmm. you no longer have the symmetry between these two files, right? You can no longer have the substitution, uh -huh. right? So therefore, you, you, you cannot optimize your problem as much as you could before because you find fewer symmetries, right? You'll, Whereas, find, you'll find fewer symmetries, but the trade-off is um, that you, you've also reduced my search space. Now, because you've given me more specific bounds, I have to allocate fewer Boolean variables to represent each relation. So if you go on your formulas, then your search space is huge. Huge, and exactly. And you have lots of symmetries. That's exactly right. So it's a trade-off between them. Yes, yes, that's exactly right. 
And um, so that was the bad news. Detecting all, all symmetries is hard. The good news is that you don't need all the symmetries. In fact, even if you could find all of them, you couldn't use all of them because there could be exponentially many of them. And you can only give a polynomial amount of information to the SAT solver. So um, what I do instead, I use um, this new algorithm called uh, symmetry by base partitioning, where I detect only the symmetries that correspond to this thing called a base partition. And I will tell you uh, now what that thing is. As the definition says, it is a partitioning of the universe into sets of atoms such that each non-empty lower and upper bound can be expressed as a union of products of those partitions. Now, to check that what I've shown you um, here does satisfy the definition, uh, let me highlight a few things. So for the files and the root, this is trivially true, right? I can express that upper bound simply as the green partition, and here the lower and the uh, upper bound correspond to the blue partition, right? Clearly, it's expressible using what's shown on the screen. Uh, for the directories, um, it is the union of the gray and the blue partition. And for the contents relation, we can uh, expand this cross product to look like this. So it satisfies definition. It is a union of cross products of the partitions. And in fact, the one that I'm showing you right now is the coarsest such partitioning of the universe. And uh, the symmetries that correspond to this partitioning are those permutations that only permute things within each partition. And in this case, for this small problem, it so happens that uh, that defines all the symmetries of the problem. It's, of course, not true in general, but for this problem, it is. Could we express something like this folder must be the ancestor of another folder? And if so, then by looking at only at the bounds, we may not be able to correctly detect the symmetries, right? Uh, no, actually, um, I, can, I can show you later on. I, I can show you the proof if you want to uh, later on that uh, this is in fact true, that you, can, th that you only need to look at the bounds, not, not the formula. But even if we are, we are allowed to express constraints like this folder must be the ancestor. Well, of that's the folder. thing. In the formula itself, right, you can't refer to the atoms. You can only, the leaves of your formula are only relations. So the only way you can say this folder is by creating a relation that is bound to this folder, and then it goes into the bounds, right? So that's, the, uh, that's actually the key behind the proof, is that you can't pinpoint anywhere in the universe using the formula. You can only do it using the relations, using the bounds, that is. Because, because that means you can't express the bounds using the relations, because you cannot refer to the atoms in the relations that you just told me. Not in the formula. In so, the yeah, so, so if you want a, um, if you want to represent a constant within a formula, you create a relation that has the same lower and upper bound, and that will give you the constant. But inside of the formula itself, the leaves of the formula can never be the atoms or the tuples. They can only be relations. But you have the option of binding the relations so that they're actually constants. And um, how do we detect this thing? Well, we use a greedy algorithm that starts with the optimistic uh, assumption that um, everything uh, in the universe is symmetric. And we refine this assumption based on the lower and the upper bounds. So uh, here it is. We, we, we pick one of, the, one of the declarations. It doesn't, it doesn't matter which order we pick them in. And uh, we ask, does this um, partitioning that we have right now satisfy the definition of base partitioning for the uh, upper bound of the file. Is it a base partitioning? Can we express the thing uh, on the right with the thing on the left? Uh, the answer is no. The partition is, uh, the partition is too big. Uh, then what we do is we ask, what is the smallest number of slices that we need to make uh, uh, into this set so that the def definition is satisfied? And the answer, of course, is you simply split uh, the atoms into directories and the file, so the definition is now satisfied. Uh, we do the same thing for the directories. Um, is, this, is this a good ba base partitioning for the directories? Yeah, the answer is yes, so we don't need to do anything. Uh, for the contents, the answer is once again yes, uh, union of cross products. And when finally, when we come to the root, this, this time around the answer is no, because the only candidate that we have is too big, and uh, the smallest number of cuts is one, and when we do it, we end up with the thing that I've shown you before. Uh, now that we have a base partitioning, 
what we actually use it for, the way this, this information is conve conveyed to the SAT solver, is uh, we create a thing called a symmetry breaking predicate. This is simply a formula that is true of at least one isomorphism, uh, one binding for each isomorphism class. And uh, that's how we uh, prune the search space. This is simply conjoined to the thing that comes out of the translator. All right, um, we're ready for core extraction. And uh, we're coming back to uh, Nikolai's point. Uh, this is the instance that I've shown you before, but it also allows this undesirable behavior. Um, it allows the files, as well as the directories, to have uh, multiple parents. And we don't want that. We want this thing to be a tree. So what do we do? Well, we add more constraints. So here are two new constraints highlighted in green. The first one says that each file has one parent. And the second one says that each directory has one parent. Um, so what do you think? Did I, did I do this right? Do we have a tree? No, I don't. That's actually, uh, that, that's correct. Uh, there are no solutions. Why? Any ideas? That's exactly right. And uh, Kotkod will, um, in this case, come back and highlight these constraints. It will actually just give them back to you. And these form an unsatisfiable core of this formula. By themselves, they're unsatisfiable. And in fact, this is a minimal unsatisfiable core because if you throw out any of the pink things, the, the remaining pink things will become uh, satisfiable. And the reason why this doesn't work is that the first constraint says that the root is a directory. The next two uh, that constrain the contents relation say that root cannot have a parent. But this guy says that each directory has to have a parent. So there is your contradiction. And uh, you can see for six constraints, it's not a big deal. You know, you could comment them out one by one and rerun the analysis and find where the conflict is. But if you have 100 of them and only four of them are conflicting, uh, that approach wouldn't scale very well. Before I go into uh, telling you how this algorithm works, uh, let's first establish some uh, common terminology. Uh, we start out with a set of declarative constraints, which I will uh, represent symbolically as these labeled um, gray circles. Uh, the dark gray circles are the ones that are in the core, the constraints that are in the core, the light ones um, in the minimal core, and the light ones are uh, the ones that are not. Uh, these constraints are translated, uh, each constraint, to a set of clauses in conjunctive normal form, and you can see that some of the clauses may be shared because of the sharing detection mechanism that I was uh, talking about before. And uh, when you feed these things to the SAT solver, what it's going to do, it's going to come up with a proof that these clauses are unsatisfiable. Uh, this proof takes the form of a DAG. Uh, it essentially showing the learning steps that the solver took in order to reach a contradiction uh, or a conflict, which is represented by the empty blue square, uh, the, the, the blue circles are the clauses that were learned by the SAT solver. Now, the sources of this graph, highlighted in blue, form an unsatisfiable core of the translation clauses. And know that this corresponds to the defin definition that I gave you before. It's a subset of all the clauses. And it's unsatisfiable because clearly the solver, ne solver needed only these guys to reach a conflict. It didn't need the rest of them. Um, the simplest algorithm that you can imagine for finding a minimal unsatisfiable core is the so-called naive extractor. Um, it starts out by um, taking in all the top-level constraints and putting them into this set K, which at the end of this algorithm will contain a minimal core. Uh, then it asks, have we marked everything in K? Well, we haven't done anything yet, so the answer is no. So pick one of them. Let's say we pick F2, uh, F0. We mark it. And then what we do is we feed to the solver everything, uh, the clauses that correspond to everything in K but C, right? So we're testing uh, F0 for the presence in the core by trying to see if the remaining constraints without F0 are satisfiable. So the solver will do some learning. So you will get some uh, blue circles. But it will not learn that there is a contradiction because this guy is in the core. And by definition, if you take him out, the thing becomes satisfiable, right? So this test right here, uh, whether there is a contradiction in the graph or not, fails. And we go back to the beginning. So we know now that F0 belongs to the core. 
Um, so we pick a more interesting one. Let's say F2, which is in light gray. Remember, it means it's not in the core. We mark it. And after we solve everything uh, for all the clauses in K except F2, we find that this time around, it actually does include a conflict. And um, it means that we don't need F2, right? I've just sold everything without F2, and it's still unsatisfiable. So I don't need it to prove unsatisfiability. And I can remove it from the set K. And I go back to the beginning, and I repeat this until I have seen, I have marked every top level constraint. So it is this simple enough, right? So this simple algorithm will work for small, easy to solve problems. Um, but it won't scale very well. Uh, to sort of make it scale to more medium hard problems, uh, let's say, we can uh, make the following observation. Let's go back to the step where we have ejected um, F2 from the core. What I want you to look at now is the things that I've highlighted in blue. These are the sources of this graph G. And note that these sources don't include F4. So we can prove that K minus C is unsatisfiable without using the constraints that come, or the clause that come from F4. So in this step, we could have ejected F4 as well as F2, right? And had fewer iterations. And of course, fewer iterations is better, is, is better because the thing that's most expensive is calling the SAT solver. So if we do that small improvement to our algorithm, we get the so-called simple core extractor. And it starts out by first solving um, all the constraints to get a, an initial um, resolution refutation, which we will call gamma. What it does now, it sets k to be all the top level constraints which are needed in order to generate the sources of gamma. For this particular proof, it turns out that you need all of them. So we haven't gained anything yet. Um, uh, so we, we haven't marked everything yet. And uh, that bubble up there, it just means that we're storing gamma somewhere in memory. Um, we pick an unmarked constraint, F2, again, because that one was, was more interesting. Know that if we actually pick something that's in the core, uh, it goes to the same loop. So nothing, nothing interesting happens. Uh, we mark it. And we solve. We get the same graph as before. It is unsat. And what we do now, instead of simply ejecting F2 from the core, we set gamma to G. And we go back to the previous step, which says, once again, set K to correspond only to those top level constraints needed to generate the sources of G uh, and uh, sources of gamma. And uh, know that in this case, we have thrown out both F2 and F4 from the core. Now, it turns out that you can actually do even better. And I promise this is the last uh, improvement that I'm going to put you through. Um, if we go back to the part where we do the solving, and if you, if you um, look at uh, the things that are highlighted in pink, uh, what this is essentially showing you that while it was trying to compute G, the SAT solver had to relearn some of the same clauses that it has already learned while trying to compute gamma. So what this is telling you is that you could actually solve the SAT, see if the SAT solver some work by giving it these resolvents up front, as opposed to making it you know, redo all this work and uh, relearn that part of the graph. And uh, this finally brings us to the last version of this algorithm. And this is the one that is actually implemented in Kotkod. It's called recycling core extraction. It starts in the same way as the simple one. We compute gamma. Uh, we set k to um, constraints corresponding to the sources of gamma. And uh, we pick F2 again. And the thing that's different now is this step. Know that before we were saying um, set G to the solution of uh, the clauses corresponding to K minus C. What we're doing now is, yes, we are definitely going to use the clauses corresponding to K minus C. But we're also going to use everything in gamma that can be learned from these guys and solely from these guys. And that, those are the constraints highlighted in pink. Notice that the constraints that I have ejected are the ones that have a path to the two things that uh, we can't use because uh, the only way to generate them is from F2. Okay? 
So when I feed this to the SAT solver, it comes back with a graph G. Because I can't tell a partial um, graph to the SAT solver, I can only um, feed these resolvents that used to be resolvents in gamma just simply as um, other constraints to G, so um, to, to the SAT solver. So um, it treats these uh, as though they came from the translator, and uh, the graph this time around has fewer learning steps. Now, it's unset again, uh, but before we can set uh, gamma to G, we have to fix it. The reason why we have to fix it is the way it looks right now, it is not a valid proof that uh, these constraints are unsatisfiable. The reason why is that um, G uses um, some of the um, clauses which are old resolvents, and they weren't generated by the translator, right? So it's not a valid proof that, that these guys alone are unsatisfiable. In order to make it a valid proof, we have to fix it. So we reintroduce some of the old edges from gamma, the ones that we actually need. Uh, the the, the resolves that we didn't need, we simply ignore them and uh, we throw them away. And uh, after we set uh, G to gamma, we go back to the beginning uh, the same way we did in the simple core extractor. And uh, now we eject F2 and F4. So that's it for the uh, core extraction, and that is it for the technical part of the talk. Uh, we're ready to see some numbers now. Uh, this chart um, is showing uh, the performance of COTCOD compared to uh, one, two, three, four other model finders. Uh, one of them is Alloy 3, which also works on relational logic. Uh, the remaining two work on pure first order logic. Um, the graph is on the logarithmic scale. It shows the number of seconds taken by each solver to solve, um, to try and find a model um, for each of these problems in, in, the, specified, uh, in the specified universe. Uh, the blue bars correspond to COTCOD, the yellow bars correspond to Alloy 3, and you will notice that for most of these problems, COTCOD's bars are half as big as Alloy bars, uh, saying essentially that it's about an order of magnitude faster in general. Now, all of these problems, uh, most of them, in fact, were taken from a standard library of benchmarks for our first order logic called TPTP. So what this graph is also showing you is that COTCOD is competitive with first order model finders on first order logic problems for which it's not optimized. The things on which we are not as well suited as, say, Paradox or MACE are problems with deeply nested quantifiers and equalities with deeply nested terms. And some instances of those problems are given here. And you can see that the blue bars are significantly higher than the green bars or the pink bars. Now, for the core extraction, uh, let's first compare the recycling extractor to the naive extractor. Um, here, uh, the x-axis, again, are the problems that were solved. Um, the y-axis now is the ratio of the time taken by the naive extractor uh, to the one taken by the recycling core extractor. So what it, it's showing you is the improvement. How many times is the recycling one faster than the naive one? And uh, these problems are sorted in the order of hardness. Uh, you can actually compute a statistic that we call an n-score uh, that will predict how hard a thing is expected to be for the naive algorithm. And that's how we sort them. Uh, the things that are expected to be easy, shown in green, uh, medium, shown in blue, and hard, shown in pink. Uh, so the numbers on top uh, give you the average speed up of the recycling extractor over the uh, naive one on various kinds of problems. So as you can see, um, on the easy and medium ones, the gain isn't so significant, which is intuitive, right? So if you have an easy problem, you don't have to be particularly clever about solving it. Uh, for the hard ones, however, we are on average 30 times faster. Uh, for the simple versus recycling, note that um, the blue and the green regions become wider because the simple one is slightly better than the naive one, so more things are easier for it, right? But for the things that are really hard, still the recycling algorithm performs a lot better, uh, which again corresponds, uh, corresponds to the intuition. So um, the research or the work that I've been describing today um, opens up a lot of um, new directions for problems that are interesting, hard, and fun, uh, both for the 
core technology in Kotkot itself, as well as um, the wider questions um, of how this uh, technology can be used for analysis in software engineering um, and for other applications as well, essentially how to um, automate some of the uh, tasks involved with software engineering um, a bit more than they are today. So um, for the um, core technology itself, uh, the thing that uh, we have been, um, we're very excited about is the recent advances in non-SAT decision procedures such as SMT, um, Darwin, and HiSAT. And uh, in fact, relation logic alone uh, will get you a long way, but it, uh, it's not enough for some applications. So for example, uh, we have been contacted recently by a researcher from Airbus um, who would like to do more numerically intensive um, checks, uh, essentially to combine relational logic with some kind of a, an, an arithmetic decision procedures, uh, procedure which is uh, uh, in the works right now. Uh, beyond CODCOD, uh, the thing that has been cropping up recently in my own research and uh, that of my colleagues is um, what kind of confidence um, can we have in this um, finite exhaustive search that CODCOD does? So, um, for example, um, could we come up with some theorem or some measure that uh, we can tell our user, if you check your design with, in a universe of 20, I guarantee that there will be no bugs in the universe of 21, or I guarantee that with a very high probability. So that is um, one question that's very interesting, and it would be great if we, we could find some subset of the logic um, for which this may be true. And um, that's it. Uh, thank you for your attention, and I'll be happy to take more questions now. Yes? I was surprised when you were talking about the finding the base Partitioning. Based partitioning. It seems to me that uh, you said that uh, there was a, it wasn't necessarily good to find too many of those because it increased the complexity of the, of the SAT problem. Mm -hmm. But it looked to me like what you're doing there is proving equivalence classes where you could simply substitute a single element for two or more elements in the original problem and unilaterally shrink the problem that you sent the SAT solver and then simply generate the full universe of solutions after that by permutation? Um, maybe. I, 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 I've never thought about it that way. You said that when you, when you detect the symmetries, then I thought you said that you just conjoin something to, uh, the, translation. Um, right, to the translation. Um, so you don't, um, that is when you translate the expressions and things like mm -hmm. that, that you didn't show, the, the, um, you don't do anything there to, uh, to order the things. You, it's just something that you can join to the, to the SAT form idea. That's right, that's right. Um, uh, it's, I've, this, this, this technique of using the symmetry breaking predicate is, is quite old. I think the first paper that was uh, done on this by uh, uh, Crawford et al. was in the 70s, I think. Um, and it just, it just um, one of those things that uh, turns out to work well. And um, it's um, essentially an engineering decision as to how much symmetry you want to break, because there's a trade-off, right? If you, if you give it too big of a symmetry breaking predicate, you're going to make the problem too hard. Uh, but if you don't give it enough, again, it's going to be too hard because your search space is going to be, uh, going to be too big. But you're gonna, at some point, you have, for example, a function with with some some error um, mm -hmm. and and it takes a parameter, like mm -hmm. for example, one of these files. Mm -hmm. um, then you could imagine two terms: one that takes that function with the with the uh, with the one file, or that takes the function with the other one. Mm -hmm. And it could be that the symmetries are such that that you really would like to treat those two uh, as the same equivalent. As well. So then, if you just conjoin another predicate, uh, you're going to say that those two are, are equal, or um, I mean, you're going to Apparently, your translation is going to generate both terms, mm -hmm. but then but you can join says that those two are interchangeable, or, or what does uh, it like? Usually, um, so there, there are many ways to uh, generate these predicates. So there is a particular predicate that you can generate uh, that will work for only for functions. Um, the one that um, I generate is um, a, a more general one. It's called a Lex Slater symmetry breaking predicate, uh, which basically means you take all the bits that represent your relations, 
you put them into a large string, you apply one of the symmetry permutations to that string, and then you say, uh, you construct a circuit that says the original one is less than or equal to the next one. And that basically gives priority to uh, uh, the solutions that correspond to you know, the original ordering of the atoms in the universe. But, but doing that ordering, you encode that in the um, in the, in the formula, that's, that's as correct. to doing some pre-processing to uh, write. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's correct, that's correct. Supposing the input to cut cut just happens to be a decidable, in a decidable fragment of relational logic, mm -hmm. and there was some decision procedure for it, what, is, is there any connection between the computation that is being performed by your tool and the computation that would be performed by a decision procedure for that. I mean, for example, I'm wondering if this kind of symmetry stuff, mm -hmm. right? Uh, it can be used. It can be used to speed up even decision procedures. That's right. That's right. So how would it work? In so in in general, what I'm wondering is that you know, if you have like a formula, right, mm -hmm. large formula, mm -hmm. this part of it that might be in a completely decidable fragment, mm -hmm. and then the rest of it is undecidable, and so therefore you have to somehow bound it by doing some Fine, providing some bound and sure. doing something, right? Mm -hmm. Right now you're treating everything with this uh, model enumeration. This is way. there a way to somehow combine decision procedures with this model enumeration somewhere? Um, so we haven't tried that yet, uh, but it's definitely something that uh, we're interested in trying. I mean, that would clearly be a huge win, um, especially. Yeah, if you could prove that a part of your formula uh, has a certain property, that'd be great. Okay. More questions? All right. Thank you.